All right, welcome back to the Stages Podcast with my host, co-host rather, J.B. Hager, talking about the Amstel Gold Race. What a young, like a baby of a race, J.B. You've only been around since 66. I know, that's like puts it at, it's been around half as long as some of the classics we've been talking about, if, yeah. if not even less. Right. It's just, it's a baby race. 261, what do I have it at? 261 kilometers for you Americans, that's like 160 miles. Ooh, long day, six hours and 40 minutes for the winners. And, and you, you have a love of this race. Yep. I mean, I, it, it's personal to you. It's dear to you, however you want to describe no, it. No, I always, um, look, my love of, of the Netherlands goes way back. I, when I was, um, not to get all sappy on you people, but uh, when I first went to Europe in late 92 or throughout 93, I had a girlfriend. In Wait, how old were you? When you first well, went 90, to Europe? I was 20. When I first got over there, twenty about, twenty one, yeah, yeah. about a baby. I was, yeah, you know, that's yeah. that's that's, that's probably got to be scary. You know, a long ways from home. You know, didn't know anybody. Anyways, I got a girlfriend in nineteen ninety four from uh, from Holland, um, uh, who was also a cyclist, Daniela Overgog, who was this mm -hmm. beautiful girl, and everybody was, you know, everybody wanted to be uh, her boyfriend. So somehow my my dumb ass managed to do it, and so was it your Metallica T shirt. It was um, that or the maiden tea. I don't know which uh, she, she had never heard of either. But um, no, but it was just uh, enjoyed my time in that country with her and her family. And then later on in my. Oh, so it was kind of serious. You're like meeting yeah, the family no, and everything? Oh, for sure. Stay at the house, the whole. Yeah, it was. It, that was your first. Maybe too serious. Really? Yeah. That was the first one to take you in. Over yeah. There, right? But anyways, then when I came back post cancer, it, it was just, I think, two things. One. Um, uh, it, it was, as we talked last week, this race, they've now flipped them, right? So this race was the last spring classic back in my day, whereas now they've flipped it with Liege. So now Liege, best on Liege will be the last spring classic. So it was a week later back then. And it was really, a, it was for me in the run up to the tour, it was the first true test. Like that was the thing that we would use to say, okay, are we on uh, is our springboard into May and June, are we on track? And look, the race is very, very hard. It's obviously long. Uh, if you saw Lawson Craddock's Strava file from uh, yesterday, you saw, I mean, 12,000 vertical feet of climbing. Mm -hmm. Think about that when your longest climb is, a, is one kilometer, maybe one and a half kilometers, and you somehow over the course of the day, 12,000 vertical feet, that yeah. is a shit ton of climbing. Well, we'll get more into Lawson uh, and, and, and talking about him just a little bit, but uh, an, an American who had a, yeah. had a good race. So I'm, I'm anxious to talk about that. And yeah. I know you know him and ride with him a lot. But uh, before we get too much into breaking down what happened um, on Sunday at the race, uh, a little more of your history there. I mean, yeah. Worlds was there. Yep. The 1998 Worlds, and for those of you, most of you probably know this, but the, if you don't, the Worlds uh, changes venues every year, and, and um, it, it might have been back to Holland since then. I don't know, but I did I did the World Championships in 1998, uh, both the time trial and the road race, um, which uh, was in this part of uh, of Holland, and, and of course, like any, you know, most countries or all countries in Europe, they have different regions and different areas. And this is the Limburg region, which is the hilly, lumpy region, which just so you also know, is also very close to Liège, where next week's World Cup will be. Um, so they had the worlds there. Um, it, it was basically 16 laps around the Kalberg, which is the kind of the most iconic, famous climb there. Um, and boy, sure enough, again, long day, 160 mile day, we're, we're, we're sitting on the start line. And we have, you know, 16 laps uh, and the finish is on top of the Calberg. Uh, and sure enough, we're just sitting there on the start line and it starts to rain. So it's like 48 degrees and now it's raining. Uh, and it just, you just see, and I was sitting, I was actually sitting on the start line next to Dylan Casey. And for some reason we were on the front row. We were up you know, near the front at least. And uh, he says, uh, he says, oh no, it's, it's starting to rain. And I said, hey, Dylan turn around and he turns around and I said, you see all those guys back there? He says, yeah. And I said, half of them just quit the race. <laughs> you were trying to keep his head in the yeah. game and your own, right? And, and I mean, you, what are you going to do? I mean, you got, 
we were going to be six plus six or seven hours out there on a, on a hilly technical circuit in the rain. I mean, what do you, you, know, you, I mean, I guess you could just go back to the t- team hotel, but I mean, what? I suck it, it up. That makes sense. I guess if, if, yeah, if half the people are going to, are checking out because of the conditions. For sure. Cause, it's Because they raced the, re- the right. weekend before, they're going to r- race again. I mean, this, this, I didn't realize until we started covering the spring season, just, how much racing there is. Mm. I mean, it's a lot. There's a lot. A lot of demand. So crappy day, they're checked out. They're like, half the field is a non-factor. Yeah. Yeah. So we, you know, we, we, we you know, they, they all started, but you just knew that they're the, not racing. the, the they're first not chance it. they got to, you know, to steer it back to the hotel and the hot shower, Their they were going to do it. So, but the, by, speaking of weather, this race, I mean, a lot of times it is contested in bad weather. They had beautiful weather where yeah. it looked and and I don't know what the temper air temperature was, but you didn't see arm warmers, leg warmers, long gloves. It, I mean, it looked beautiful. The fans on the side of the road looked like they were out on a nice spring day. And so, man, and, and you know, I should have said at the top of the show, I thought it was super exciting. I thought the, come, the finale was exciting. There was, was a lot good. of the coverage was good. A lot of attacks. We had the we had the of course the the mandatory. You know, everybody look at Peter Sagan show. Right, <laughs> that's he gets a lot of TV time, but that's. Well, and I mean, I mean, look at him meaning, oh, all, meaning all his peers. Go, oh, yeah. 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 Peter, do you mind if we just sit here on the wheel? <laughs> right, right. You're the favorite, so just why don't you go ahead and ride us to the finish line, and then we'll try to beat you. Well, he wasn't playing that shit. Which became a determining factor in the two getting away, everyone watching Peter again. Right. Yeah. And again, before we move too far into that, I, would, I just... I did some searching. I knew you had a couple of second place finishes at that race. First loser. That's me. <laughs> In particular, mm-hmm. 1999 yeah, was terrible. brutal to yeah. watch. I, I'll give you another little funny inside baseball story that I don't know if I've ever said publicly, but you know, I get away in 99. I get away. Uh, gosh, I think it's me. It's me. Um, Marcus Berg and uh, Michael Bogert, a Dutch writer on Rival Bank. Actually, I think they, th- at that time they were both on Rival Bank. So back in the day, you had the big Dutch team was Rival Bank. If they didn't win Amstel Gold Race or and Tour Holland, which is later mm-hmm. in the year, if they don't win Amstel Gold somebody's Race, getting I mean, fired. somebody's getting fired. Yeah. It is yeah. a huge deal. I didn't. I don't see that dynamic now with the Dutch teams. Although we will get into Sunweb and what happened to Michael Matthews, but um, if they didn't win back then, somebody was getting fired. So I get. I go to the line with these three guys. I'm like, I got this. I got this. And Michael Bogert is like, you know, a, a fucking turtle can beat him in the sprint. <laughs> and so he, sure enough, you know, me, I just hear what I just said. Who's the idiot here? And he, he beat me in the sprint. You know, it was close, but I was just sitting there going, how is this happening? No, 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 no. This is not happening. But um, sure enough, yeah, he won. And No, and- you say close. If people want to watch it on YouTube, it's, I mean, we're talking a, a tire width too close but we so we're standing on the uh uh, uh standing on the podium and you know, do, they do the shot where everybody gets on the top step and you put your arms around you know they take the picture and everything and I, I leaned in and i whispered in his ear and i said um you can pay me back in july <laughs> and he he looked at me like like you gave like no like no, you, like no like what what are you talking about july what are you what are you gonna do in july because nobody <laughs> this is my sort of my first year for your back, mm-hmm. he's like, oh yeah, no what, one what, was what, even what, thinking about yeah, what's you. He, for what's he talking about, July? <laughs> and I'm like, you'll see. No one knew at that point, but that's what you were aiming yeah, for. We've talked about it since. I was like, remember, I told you, you can pay me. You can pay me. <laughs> that's back. a great story. Yeah, that's a great story. In 2001 was another race where you got second if somebody wants. Eric to. Decker. Now that I should have that you know that particular episode or, or edition, I knew that. I mean, Decker was fast. You know, obviously. Home race, uh, I had no chance okay. other than to try to get away, which I, I couldn't get away. And then, yeah, he was going to beat me. I was shocked. I guess I've never watched the Amstel Gold. Mm-hmm. Um, the roads are different. I mean, just clearly night and day different from right. anything else you watch. Right. Very narrow, very clean looking, but a lot of, a lot of turns. It's like, it looks like a, a golf cart path yeah, at times. Guys hate a lot of guys hate this race because there there are so many turns and riding over the course of a six hour six and a half hour day when you're turning that much and of course you know when you turn like that 
the, the next thing that's coming after the turn is a hill or what they call mm -hmm. a berg. So mm -hmm. they had 35 of these bergs. It's funny. Like I pulled up the, as I was watching it, I had the, like the official like turn by turn thing with all yeah, the Ks. Yeah. So they have all the bergs, the Kalberg, the Kahilmaberg, the Kuttenberg, the Fromberg, the Eiserbosberg, the Kreuzerberg, the Guppenberg. I mean, just berg after berg. So, you know, when you take those sharp turns on the narrow road, you're going to be staring up, you know, in the face of a berg. Well, and with, and I'm speculating, I don't know. I've, mm. it, when you're taking a lot of, a lot of turns like that on mm -hmm. a very narrow road, you're not sweeping and keeping up the speed like you do in a lot of other races. You are when you're in the front. That's the difference. Okay. You get to, you get that, you, you can take that corner. Uh, it just seems the, like you'd have a lot of more braking and accelerating, which would beat again, you down. That's why you want to be first 10. So and that's, that's why, you know, that's what makes these races so hard is guys are full gas just to make the turn. Right. Oh, and then you're out of the turn and now you got to start to climb. And if you're, and if you're in the back, just keep in mind, you know, if you're in the back half, you are breaking and the first half is sprinting. They're gone. So just, yeah, you can, you, it's just the rubber band effect. Yeah, it is just what does they call it. It's, um, it gets a real accordion thing there's going. No, there's no smart way to, to, to ride in the back in a race like this. But again, I mean, this is, this is why people, a lot of guys just don't like the race. If it's wet, it's very dangerous because of those, all the tight twisty turns. And, you know, the one thing, I, the only thing I will add about the roads is as opposed to what we saw last week, obviously in Roubaix and, and even in Flanders, the pavement and the, the road surfaces in Holland are, are very nice. So when you see them right, I mean, it's, it's a smooth surface. There's no, you know, mystery, you know, uh, surprise cracks in the road that, that come up in places like Belgium and, mm -hmm. and France. But um, nonetheless, it, it, it gets hard. Look, all those turns, again, 12,000 vert. Ooh. You on some of the classics in the cobble sections where it's narrow, you explain the difficulty of support, support cars. Mm -hmm. This race looked to me like your team car could be way back there with the narrow roads. And of course the combination of narrow roads and that much undulation means that that field is then strung out. The cars can't get around. You can try, you might get around a group or two, mm -hmm. but you're still way, way, way far back. Again, we saw it, like we've said every week, um, during the classic season, you have the people standing on the side of the road with, with the wheels and the bottles because the team car just can't, can't get there. So you're, you're stuck with either using that uh, person on the side of the road that your team is designated to be there or neutral, mm -hmm. right? And so... Uh, and then this <laughs> stuck out with me um, as I was watching it. Uh, there was a really bad neutral support change. Mm. Michael, I don't remember Michael Matthews. Horrible. Right. I was watching it and it was like, it's like, you know, if you watch a car racing, like it's just so fine tuned and most of bike racing, you just see it and it just felt like an eternity. Well, yeah, it was because it was an eternity, <laughs> actually. Were you, were you watching that and yeah, cringing well, at the same time? It, it, well, yeah, because you had Michael Matthews, who was two things. One was, in my opinion, one of the top three favorites, uh, but more importantly, races for a Dutch team. Mm -hmm. So going back to this thing I talked about, you know, from my generation where it, it is a huge race for these Dutch teams. Sunweb is, is the biggest Dutch team. Um, and he's perfectly suited for this race. If anybody can hang in there and, and, and come around Peter Sagan, it's Michael Matthews in this race. A home, essentially he's Australian, but it's essentially a home race for him. Lots of pressure from the team and the sponsor. So he, he, you know, has a rear, we don't know if it's a slow leak or, or something. He's waiting, waiting, waiting. You can tell he's trying to get his team car cause he knows he knows what's going to happen mm -hmm. when this this goob on the back of this moto shows up, and and sure enough, man, he he uh, he, he did a couple things wrong too. You know, he didn't have it down. You know, it's always you when you're going to get a wheel change, a rear wheel change, you always get um, that chain in the very lowest cog, so that wheel comes out mm -hmm. as easy as possible. And the guy who replaces the wheel knows exactly where to put it. He, if you if you have it three or four up. I mean, mm -hmm. is the guy going to, who's put in, say the guy's great, the mechanic, mm -hmm. whether it's your mechanic or neutral, you think he's going to look at it and go, gosh, that looks like it's three or four up. I'll just put it right here. No, mm -hmm. you put it all the way down in the mm -hmm. 11. Mm -hmm. That wheel comes right out and the mechanic puts it right back in. The downside is you have to start in the 11, but right. still, um, the guy who got off, it was, it was. Uh, when you start in an 11, that's where the, the really good mechanics give you one hell of a push mm -hmm. and they can run really well for about four steps. Mm -hmm. And this guy just went 
Yeah. Like barely nudged him. I was yeah. watching. I go, that's like one of the worst wheel changes I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it um, it definitely, I, th- I think it changed the dynamic of this race. I think if he's there with his skill set uh, alongside Sagan, um, yeah, it changes the, the certainly changes the ending. I, I'm not saying that, that, that Michael Baldwin wouldn't have won, but it would have, it would have changed things. All right. I'm, I want to ask something that's pretty naive, but um, as I saw the neutral Shimano car, there's wheels. There were a lot of the, the wheels on it for neutral support, obviously, but there were also a handful of bikes. Mm-hmm. Do they really? Do they offer neutral a neutral bike? They do, they do. I mean, there are times when when it isn't your wheel that's broken. It's a uh, you know, I mean, your damn seat could fall off. Or I mean, who knows? You know, you gotta. So yeah, they offer bikes. I mean, and things have to be pretty bad. Or you're doing really well to take a neutral bike, right? Uh, but it happens. It happens. Have you ever taken one? No, I've never taken one. Now, so you have a few choices. One is you, uh, it depends how desperate you are. You, uh, a, a team leader always has, whether it's the classics or the big tours or any race, always has somebody on that, uh, on the squad that day that has a fit very similar to them. And if, and if, and there's always the poor guy that has to have his fit be similar to my fit. Right. To so whoever is supposed to He's contend. like, my bike doesn't really fit. They're like, I don't care. <laughs> it fits Lance perfectly. <laughs> I but, never knew that. Yeah. So, so, so who was it? Who was uh, it? Chechu. So I Chechu would, I would, was I would, I would always take Chechu's bike because he's the sweetest guy ever. But <laughs> if I ever needed a bike. So you could take that bike. I you could take know. a bike from the car, um, which is your true spare bike. Right. right. That's right, right. that's the best case scenario. Or you could take one from neutral support, which I never had to do. Again, it comes into all these complications. Uh, you're riding speed plays and the, and the neutral bike is Shimano pedals right. or, or time, you know, it's, it's just all different. Like how do you, the seat height, the reach, the extension, the, the whole thing, you know, in our day, you know, assuming the pedals worked, you'd get on and they had a quick release instead mm-hmm. of a bolt for the seat. So you'd sit there and try to get the seat height, mm-hmm. right? Um, I suspect now, and if they don't, they should, because this makes perfect sense. Those should be hydraulic where you're, as you're riding along, you can just fine tune the seat height. But yeah, that, that, you know, you know, look, nobody's ever, and there's no images of anybody crossing the finish line on a neutral support bike. It just doesn't, no, nobody wants to be on that thing. <laughs> no, I just, I didn't even know it was a thing. Yeah. I mean, um, the, the, normally if they have to ride them, they'll ride them for as long as they have to, and then get that team car up there and then switch to their spare bike. Yeah. Why, in your opinion, why isn't team sky representing like, the powerhouse team that we all have seen for the last several years? It's a great question. I I think, look, I think there's the obvious. I think there's everything that's hanging over uh, Team Sky, Dave Brailsford, Chris Froome. Um, We've talked a lot about this. We did a whole episode on it. I mean, they can talk all they want to talk about how they're moving forward. I don't know who would ever say such a thing. Um, (laughs) And that they're focused and this is not a distraction, but it, it, I mean, the fact that Michael Kwiatkowski is not in the front, that front group with, I mean, look at the names that are in that front group, great riders, but uh, on any normal day, he's there with one leg. And yeah. so something's going on. I, I don't, you know, I, I have to think it's, it's pretty distracting. They're just distracted as you guys. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 yeah I mean, uh, uh, there could be, uh, there'll be others that would say that there's something way more sinister at play here. Right. Mm-hmm. So, Oh, you know, now they clamp down on them. They're testing them more, et cetera, et cetera. Now look at them. Look at we're uh, not at the, the, I, I, or, I, or I, if you, I, for the maybe, record, I don't subscribe to that. Right. I, I think it has more to do with just the external noise and pressure and the. Well, I mean, these guys. Even at Chris Froome is three thousand miles away. Probably these guys get out of the team bus. They're here for a major classic. I guarantee you, the first question for most of those guys is. You know, is a Chris Froome question and asthma. I mean, it's just the media old. beat down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, Lost and Craddock. Mm. You, ride of the day. He, I'm biased, but that was the ride of the day. I was. The, I was, the feed came on, and that was the man. first face I saw. And I was like, wow. I know. I was like, holy shit. Lawson's in the break. And you see Lawson a lot. He lives yeah, here. He lives here in Austin, Austin Texas. Texas. Great. Grew up in Houston, moved to Austin. Um, we ride together a lot. Um, he has been through a lot. I think to me, and I say, when I say ride of the day, I mean ride of the day because not just because he was in the break and still finished top 10, but if you go back 12 months, even more than 12 months, you know, we really 
rode not this off season, but the off season before we rode a lot together. And I, and I didn't, you know, I just like go out like, all right, well, what are we doing? Like, I didn't, I don't get to say, right. I'm like an old retired guy. Mm -hmm. I have to ask the pros like, okay, what is on your schedule today? Mm -hmm. And he would say, you know, one day we did six hours, 120 miles. And he had three, he said, I have some intervals. I said, okay, well, what do you got? And he says, I have three 75 minute intervals at some ridiculous wattage. I said, what? I said, you're going to do three hours and 45 minutes of intervals. I said, I'll be, I'll just sit on the wheel. So I sat on his wheel the entire day. I just rode behind him. Mm -hmm. And I, but I'm sitting there going, what? It's no, it's November. What? Three hours and 45 minutes of intervals in November and then going to the gym in the evening. I'm like, the fuck is going on here? Mm -hmm. And you know, he, he was following a program that just buried him and just, it, 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 it actually ruined but well, did two things. One, it ruined his entire season and, and potentially could have ruined uh, his career. And, and he had a very tough time. And, and just in texting with him before we went on uh, hit record here, you know, he said a year ago, I was sitting at home, not, not, uh, not sure that I would ever even race again. I would ever even, and if I did race, I would never see the front of a bike race. So to see him and the break and, and he, well, just to go back, he, he went back to coach Jim Miller, who I think has really got him back on track, obviously. Um, but to see him at the front of a big race was, I, I, I was sipping my coffee and I was like, holy, yeah, here we go. No, he looked good. Yeah. Well, he did. It was interesting. Like he, that's why I think he was, you know, ride of the day because he was in that group, which by the way, that, that breakaway went, went clear 20 minutes into the race. So what is 20 minutes in a bike race? I mean, it's, it's, you know, 10 kilometers. So they were out there. He was out there for 250 mm -hmm. kilometers in that break. You know, w which is pretty impressive. Also, too, pretty stress free, right? No mm -hmm. fighting for any corners when mm -hmm. you're with nine guys or nine however. guys working really well together. Yep. Yeah. But he was getting dropped. Like there was the one I forget the name. What's that really steep climb? The the Kuttenbergs, twenty two percent at the steepest part. He's dropped. He's he is guy number nine. Eight of them are up the road, and I was like, oh no, you know, nice try, Lawson. Well, he was the, he got back to them, and he was the longest lasting survivor of that group to still finish top 10. I mean, it was, that then is not a physical issue. That's a mental issue. And he showed that, that he's a tough kid. Yeah. I just remember we had some conversation about mm -hmm. it last July. His name came up and you were going on about how his program was just burying him and you saw it. And it was mm -hmm. that he was getting ruined as a cyclist. Yeah. And well, he let, he let Jonathan Vauders run the training. And, and I get that Jonathan Vauders is the boss. And so if the boss says you have to do this training, I mean, mm -hmm. but at some point too, the athlete has to say, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Or I, I'm not feeling good. And in and, and Lawson's, a, he, he's a sweet kid. So mm -hmm. he's not, he's not the kind of kid that's going to be like, this is bullshit. I'm not doing this anymore. Or I'm going to do my own program. He followed it. And when he followed it, 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 it ruined his season. And so I'm, it, it didn't, you know, I'm glad he's, you know, he's righted the ship and feeling better. And Jim Miller's got him fit and fast again. He sent me some of his, check this out. He sent me his, uh, his power file. No, he didn't send me his power file. He's like, do you want the power file? I said, Lawson, I couldn't read a power file to save my <laughs> life right now. So just, just give me the highlights. Like just send right, me. Right. And the other thing too, he did do as well is he put his race up on Strava, which mm -hmm. I thought was really cool. So that's how I know that, that it was 12,000 vertical feet of climbing. So if you any y'all y'all are on Strava, go go give Lawson Craddock some kudos because he deserves it. But um, sixteen, well, let me back six thousand nine hundred kilojoules, which is essentially calories. Mm -hmm. That's the amount of energy it took him to do that race. That's Jeez. that seven thousand kilojoules is is nuts. Um, by the way, he's seventy one kilos, so I don't know what that works out to be. But uh, average power for six hours and forty minutes. 290 watts wow. normalized, which means they take out the highest of the highs and they take out when you're coasting, which is zero, um, which is really kind of your true power, 330 watts for six hours and 40 minutes. The last 20 minutes normalized. All right. So in the last 20 minutes, you've ridden six and, you know, you've ridden 250 miles, 390 watts normalized. Wow. What's, what's next on the season? What's left in this season for Lawson Craddock? I mean, you don't, I mean, you don't know I what race you're going to ask him that. I don't have it in my notes and I didn't ask I mean, him. He'll, he'll what probably, would you, what would you, if that was I you? Know he's going to do, he'll race the edge best on the edge. He, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if he'll go race Flesh Malone, which is this week, which is a semi-classic in the middle of the week. But 
I suspect he'll shift, especially after that ride. He should be riding Liege, but, but, it's on Liege. but in general, if his form's coming back, like what would you say? Oh, no, Lawson, he, he, wants, he only wants to do one bike race this year. Only one. He did the Tour de France two years ago mm -hmm. and obviously didn't do it last year. He he wants to. That's where he the, needs the, to be. Yes. That's so what he's working towards. That's what every every <laughs> every person of the sport <laughs> wants to do. Like nobody's like, nah, I don't want to do the Tour de France. No, nobody says is he, that. Is he on a team that will for sure be in the Tour? Yeah, yeah. Invited? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there All right. Are. Now let's break down the the, the finish. Mm. Ballgren. That was exciting. He's and, yeah. but all, and the cameras are Smart. always and eyes are he, on Peter Sagan. So he, yeah, of course. You know, every every everybody in that front group was looking to Peter to do the work. By the way, if he could have pulled off a victory, I mean, to win Roubaix and then bounce back and win Amstel, that is unbelievably difficult to do, and shows the versatility of Peter Sagan. And look, if things go a little different, he easily could have won that race if he has a teammate, an old friend, somebody just to keep that tempo high enough so that they all stay together. But on the flip side, Astana had two guys there. So you uh -huh. had J Jacob Fuglesong and Michael Volgren. Fuglesong keeping, you saw at one point with 5K to go, uh, Fuglesong was riding tempo on the front and Volgren was just sitting on the back. Alpha, uh, this kid, this French kid, Alphaville, uh, goes from quick step, goes back and <laughs> yelling at him, get up here, pull, you know, et cetera. Because he, he knew what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. He went once, they brought him back, but then then he went again. That kid has a nose for for bike races. I mean, this is his second classic win this spring. And um, you know, he's super versatile. He can win two classics in the spring. He can go to the tour like he did last tour and be um the top domestique for somebody trying to compete for the yellow jersey. You'll remember what he remember he got in all all the trouble last summer for You'll have to remind everybody. Of that. Yeah. So uh, you guys, if you for those of you who don't remember, so Fabio Aru. You know, this was just, he never had good position, but he was in the yellow jersey. Sure enough, uh, steep uphill finish during the tour last summer. He he gets out of position again, and the gaps start opening up, and he loses the jersey. So the NBC Sports interviews Volgren at the finish line. And what happened? What happened? Was he not communicating? What, you know, why, why was he not in position? Volgren said, I don't know. And, and Volgren says to the NBC guy, he says, oh, so who has the jersey? And the guy says, Chris Froome. And he goes, oh, good. <laughs> and I mean, the team's like, wait, what? You're not supposed to say that. But what he, but I know what he, I, when he said it, I knew what he meant. He meant like, good, let them have the jersey yeah. so they can control the race. A lot of teams don't want that. So you don't want that. If you're trying to win in pair, you let them have the jersey. Shit, you go right around on the front. <laughs> That's why it's better some goofy small team have it. I had forgotten. And just about let them ride around for two weeks. As we, again, it's fun to talk about Sagan, and so I don't want to be just cliche and just keep bringing up Sagan. I want but, the big burst of the Bellagro. <laughs> but everybody is, when the, when they went, mm -hmm. everybody's watching Sagan's wheel. It was up to him. Hey, you're the world champion. You won Perry Robay. You chase this down. Mm -hmm. In your mind, is Sagan like, hey, I've already got a Robay win under my belt. You need this more Dude, than I do. There, there's nothing. He he's not. I've never. I don't know Peter Sagan, but I don't. I, I, He's not stupid. I mean, he's, he just at some point you just have to say, "Look, I, there's nothing I can do." Yeah, right. This is inevitable, and and you know he'll 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 wait. He'll have other chances. To but the the Sagan dynamic and and his form right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, does it, tactically is did that did Volgren maybe use that to his advantage? Everyone's walking Sagan and watching Sagan in this break. Here's where I'm doing my attack. Of course. And if Sagan doesn't chase, I this is my gap. And he had a teammate. Right. I mean, the, that was that right. was why he was able to do what he did. And and he got a little lucky, I will also say, in the last 400 meters when Roman Kreuziger came, you know, got nervous because Gasparotto was about to catch them. By the way, Kreuziger has won this race once before and Gasparotto has won it twice. He looks back, sees Gasparotto fast, you know, quickly approaching so he goes around um, Valgren, and I mean that was the kiss of death. And Valgren's yeah. like, "Okay, thanks, thanks for the lead out." And yeah. just, I mean, easily won. And did was it was it Kreuzinger that you told me you raced with? I raced with him and his dad. <laughs> that's <laughs> not that's that's fucked up. I mean, that's but yeah. When, but when I ran, but to, to my defense, when I How raced, how old with, was dad when? So dad, you were just a kid. I was, so yeah, that's what happens, right? So I was very, very young, and his dad was probably old. Mm -hmm. And then when I when I raced with the son, he was very, very young, and I was old. 
Right. So it just, you know, it just, that's just bizarre. Yeah. It doesn't seem mathematically possible, but, but it, it is. There <laughs> it were actually is. two or three. I think um, Mauro Gianetti I raced with, and I also raced with his son. And there was one other, I forget who, but that, that was as those years, 09 uh, and 2010. I was like, what am I doing? I'm racing with guys that I raced with their dad. Like, why? <laughs> what the fuck am I doing here? <laughs> it's just funny. It's just, no, yeah, it's right. Just... Well, it's funny now. <laughs> it's very funny. It wasn't funny then. <laughs> All right. Any final thoughts on what we saw over Amstel Gold? That was an awesome race. I enjoyed yeah. it. And what's next for us? Well, I don't know if, I don't think we're covering, look at, check it. I was in, um, I don't know, what were we doing? I think I was like inventorying art. That sounds really lame, but I was like digging through my storage unit the other day and I came across, there's all kinds of crazy old trophies and shit in there. Like there's all these tour things and someone we brought over here, but this is the Kmart classic from West Virginia in 94, uh, 93. Classic. Yes. The overall. And I think I have a couple stage win trophies from the Kmart classic. And then I came across. Oh boy. 1996 flesh will loan, which I won. Um, but this is what, I don't know what it looks like now, but this, it's even still, it's like all dirty and dusty and gross, but yeah, so you've got, uh, what does that say? Winner, it says Venker, and then down here, uh, 1996 Flesh Wallone. Wow. So that's our next classic, semi-classic, right? So you have those midweek classics that are not 260 kilometers, but 200 kilometers, but Flesh is a is an iconic, you know, an iconic one-day race. And if race. you have one of these, apparently underneath your podcast desk is the place to keep it. No, I have it. It's on the side. I don't know. I brought, we brought it. I was going to clean it up and put it on the shelf with all the other stuff up we, here. But um, you know, and then, I was thinking the shelf needs to rotate some does, stuff okay. in and out. Oh, all right. Well, we'll get on that. Um, I don't have anything to do today. <laughs> I'll do that. So that's this this week, and then next weekend is Liege, Bastogne Liege, a race that, uh, very similar to to Amstel Gold Race, but probably. I don't want to say harder, but the climbs are are harder and longer. Um, weather can be a factor, but, um, uh, and, and also just personally a race that I always really, really wanted to win yeah. and, and just uh, another race. I, I was second in a uh, time or two and it just, I just never, it, it, it was always the one where it was logical that I would win, win that race. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, that means it's perfectly suited for me. It's, it's, you could do you could replicate Liège, best on Liège in Austin, Texas. So for, for a guy living here, you could train for it. You could, you could, you know, do specific training for it. And so, but I never, I just always missed out one year. My seat broke and then other year, I don't know. It just didn't have it, man. All right. Yeah. There you go. That's right up there with Vaughn too. Like regret, like things I really wanted oh. to win. Like oh, it just gotcha. didn't. And it did, but yeah. that one didn't happen. No. And it's not ever going to happen. It's not. No. <laughs> no. Past yeah. your prime. Yeah. And then so, that's it. And, you know, then it's interesting. <laughs> we have one more week of this. And it seemed the spring classics, Milan San Remo felt like it was yesterday. I know. It so goes in a week, quickly. it's all over. And now we immediately get into Tour of Romandy, Tour of Italy. And then <sighs> next thing you know, we'll be talking about guys riding around France. So that's it for me, man. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. <laughs>